Okay, we're going to go ahead and begin. It's two minutes after. So welcome, everyone. Uh, this is something we call uh, Sunday with Monday, which I began uh, doing back in the early part of last year after uh, COVID hit, and there was no longer any traveling and going to different churches to speak and stuff. And in many ways, this is really great, as you all know, but simply because uh, I know that who is here at the moment includes everyone from Germany, England, uh, all over the United States, and probably other countries as well. Uh, we're excited to have Robert Perry with us today. We're going to be talking about the manuscript of The Course in Miracles and how that came to be, and about why Robert decided to give us this, this annotated edition of the course that we've got here. And we're really looking forward to this. Also, want to let you know that 10% of whatever comes in for today goes to Feeding America, and thanks for your help. You both of us. Hi, Robert. Hi. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you very much for having me. It's an honor to be here, especially on the 60th anniversary of you beginning ministry. Yeah, for anybody that doesn't know, it was 60 years ago today that I stepped into the pulpit for the first time and with a paying job. And uh, here we are, I went from a one room, a country church <laughs> to uh, working online after 60 years. It's sort of fun to see how this everything has changed over all this time. Mm -hmm. And Robert, why don't you, uh, for those who may not know, uh, also share with us a little bit about your, I think you came to the, the course in 81, so that'd be 40 years ago. Yeah. So you got 40 years with the course, I got 60 years in, in the ministry. Uh, share a little bit about how you came to the course and uh, why you, you took fire with it, as obviously you have. And uh, Robert, in case anybody does know, is, is totally dedicated to the course, works with a circle of atonement. He's written more books than he can even remember and uh, been very, very faithful and dedicated to teaching and uh, explaining the message of A Course in Miracles. But you give us a little background for yourself, would you? Yeah, I grew up uh, in the Protestant church, Presbyterian, then Lutheran. And in my teens, I began to just wonder, like, was it all true? Does yeah. God exist? Yeah. And so I went through a period of searching and did a lot of uh, reading and mysticism and world religions and parapsychology and mediumship and all kinds of things, near-death experiences. And I came to conclude that there is a spiritual reality because so many, it seemed like so many people were glimpsing a similar landscape when they had a glimpse of something beyond the physical. And it was a landscape that nobody had told me about in church. It had a lot to do with mm. oneness, for instance. Yeah. And so I gravitated quickly to channel material that had a Jesus focus and especially mm. Edgar Casey. Mm -hmm. And so uh, my fiance and I started an Edgar Casey study group. And we went to, in, in 1980, we went to uh, a meeting of local study group leaders for the, the, the Casey study groups. And I overheard somebody say, uh, Psychology Today, the magazine, has written an article on the woman who wrote Jesus's Course of Miracles. And I had no idea what that meant. I hadn't heard of the course at that point. And so I re read the article, which was, which was there. And I thought, this is right up my alley. But I, I didn't go out and get it. I was in college and I was kind of a cash-strapped college student. And so a number of months later, for my, my 21st birthday in 1981, a bunch of friends got together and gave it to me for my birthday. And it felt like a landmark thing. I mean, it just felt, felt big. Yeah. And uh, as it happened, I got right into the workbook, but I was so in love with the idea that truth came through all these different windows, which I still mm. believe, mm. that I felt like having a path was too narrow. It was like a you know, spiritual sort of bigotry. Mm. And I was not going to have a path. But what happened was over the next several years, the course kind of ate up my spiritual life. And I, I kept saying I'm eclectic, uh, but in practice, I was just doing the course. And mm -hmm. during this time, I, uh, my best friend uh, 
formed a relationship with Miracle Distribution Center in Southern California. He started working for them. Uh, and then they hired my first wife to work there. And then I was doing projects and then I started to teach. And by the time that all this was in motion, it was clear that the course was, it was my path, whether I liked it or not. <laughs> and so I finally kind of caved in and grew to love that fact, but it mm. took a while. I really had some, some resistance. Mm. So what was it about you that started that, that's, that rang true? About the course? Yeah. Why, why, why the course? Well, there was just so much. There were things that I wasn't very comfortable with, but then there were things that really drew me in. I loved the course's view of God. I loved the practicality of it. Mm. Um, the focus on love and forgiveness really spoke to me. The fact that there were all these practices in the workbook that one could sit down and do and feel a change in the mind. Uh, I love the beauty of the language. Mm. I remember reading the course and thinking, I really yeah. don't understand this, but it's so beautiful. Yeah. And then as time went on, more and more things about it drew me in. I started out, you know, having no idea what this was. And it took over years, and especially through teaching it, mm -hmm. I just noticed more and more and more that I loved about it. And I think actually teaching it was a major factor. Because when you stand up and are a spokesman for something, you convince yourself. Mm -hmm. Well, you've been very committed. That's very, very clear. And the, devoted your whole life to doing this work, which is wonderful. Uh, so every, I'm assuming everybody here has some familiar with the course already, I think, just given the nature of the topic that we're working with today. Yeah. So uh, why was it that you decided to give us this? Oh, it's heavy. <laughs> <laughs> How many pages is it? We got here. You, it's 2,000. 2,000, okay. 2,000 2, even. The, the printer couldn't go over that without a major kind of, you know, putting on a different press, a lot more expense. And so we oh, had I to see. like, you know, like there was 2003, I think we had to bump it down to 2000. Um, you, 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 I'm sure you were able to edit that down without any trouble. <laughs> it just took like different typesetting, but yeah. Oh, different typesetting. Yeah, that yeah. would do it too. That's yeah. great. So um, you all know, uh, well, whether you all know or not, I knew Helen. I worked with Helen during the last uh, five years of her life. I've always been very dedicated to this particular edition of The Course in Miracles because, uh, well, partly because I knew Helen and I felt that this is what she wanted to give us and from Jesus and we got it. And so tell me why you think that it was important to go ahead and, and how many hours? <laughs> you have no idea probably, right? The, no, the, it was the, a lot of years and we had years, quite a big yeah. team working on different elements. It was I a big project. Yeah. yeah. Well, what happened for me was that, first of all, in 1991, Ken Wapnick came out with Absence from Felicity, his story of Helen and the scribing of the course. And up until that moment, I had thought that virtually everything she took down was in the course. And I'd heard that there were a few things about Freud and about Carl Jung, and I assumed they were isolated sentences. So when that came out, there were thousands of words in there that I had never seen. And I fell in love with that extra material. It just became a part of me. I, I, I wore out my copy of Absence from Felicity and had to went and got it recovered by a, by a place really? that would, yeah, because I, I wanted to keep all the notes that I'd done, that I'd made. Wow. That. And, and those, that extra material, it became part of me. It became part of my outlook and, and my understanding of practical matters. So that was the beginning of it. And then what happened is in the year 2000 and 2001, earlier editions of the course itself that had been produced by Helen and Bill, they leaked out. Right. And what was interesting for me when, when the uh, Hugh Lynn Casey, which was the first thing that leaked out, when I got a hold of it, the first place I went to 
was a place in chapter two that talks about healing and magic and medicine and so on, because I had long suspected that there was an editing error there, that something was wrong mm. in the editing. And it, and the original said, not in words, but the, in terms of the, the, the ideas, the original said exactly what I suspected it must have originally said. And when I got a hold of the ear text a year later, um, the same thing happened. I went to an, a certain spot in the workbook where I felt it was literally impossible based on the FIP edition to figure out whether you should do one practice period of 15 minutes or do two practice periods of 15 minutes. This was, this was for a 10-day review period. And I thought it must be clearer in the original dictation. And sure enough, it was. It was clearly two. Mm. So when those came out, um, it wasn't just the fact that I felt that some, some things had gone awry with the editing. It was just this wealth of information that was in those earlier editions. And it was like with Absence from Felicity, as I saw this material I'd never seen before, it captivated me. It felt like this is really Jesus. And it kind of went in. And I started to think, you know, something is not quite right that so much was taken out and also that so much wording was changed. And so I started to study the, um, in kind of parallel columns, the different mm -hmm. editions I had um, access to, you know, yeah. the Eurotext and the Hewlett and Casey and the FIP and looking across the columns, you could really see what happened with the editing and what the editing pa patterns were. Right. And it just became, it felt to me like so much of Jesus got left on the cutting room floor <laughs> and it felt extremely helpful to me. It didn't feel in conflict with the course that as I knew it and loved it, it just seemed like this has to be out there. And so that was really the genesis of the project, which, which kind of began, I'd say around 2003, 2004, it's very, very beginnings were back then, yeah. but it grew out of the convictions that I just mentioned. For people who don't know, maybe you can explain a little bit about the difference between the Hugh Lynn, the Urtex and FIP editions. Why? Yeah, sure. So, so I'll just go through the, the whole chain. Um, yeah, okay. Helen, when she heard the voice, she took it down on the pages of her shorthand notebooks, um, little steno pads in handwriting. And it's mostly in handwriting. Some of it is in shorthand symbols for really common words like the and 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 him and so on. And then she would dictate to Bill from her shorthand notebooks and he would type up what she dictated. Although she didn't dictate everything she wrote down to him. There were things that she left in her notebooks. So he would type it up and his typescript is what they called the urtext, which is, you know, just means like original text. Mm -hmm. um, and then according to Ken Wapnick, there was what he called the second draft. And that's where Helen, by herself, retyped the urtext text, just the text, mm -hmm. and edited it as she went. Mm -hmm. And then she and Bill Thetford took that second draft and edited it to become the Hewling Casey edition, or they called it the Hewling version because they sent a copy to Hewling Casey. And interestingly, I was in the Edgar Casey library in 1982 in a little side room that's normally locked. And I stumbled across that version, but I was a brand new course student. I didn't oh. know what I was holding in my hand. Wow. But I remember the note, the handwritten note on the front. And when the Hugh and Casey version sneaked out, you know, nearly 20 years later, that, that handwritten note is exactly as I remember it. Anyway, so they produced that version, sent it to Hugh and Casey, who was the son of Edgar Casey, um, who started the Association of Research and Enlightenment. And then Helen and Ken Wapnick took the Hugh and Casey and edited that to produce the FIP first edition that was published mm -hmm. in 1976. So there was that whole chain of editing and different versions. All right. 
So it was my understanding that um, Helen said in the end that, that what they eventually come up with in the FIP edition is what Jesus wanted to share with us. So what do you think, is, is there, what differences would you see between the different edition? I mean, between what you've come up with here. And, well, and does it make a difference that there's a difference? <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, that's, those are big questions. Those um, are big questions. That's a big yeah. question. Yeah. Well, what I would say is that, yes, of course, I know Helen approved the FIP edition. Um, although my understanding is that she and Bill thought they were basically done with the Healing Casey version. Um, what the conclusion I came to as I looked across those parallel columns of the different versions was that the editing was a very human product. You know, I've been with the course, as you said, like 40 years, and I become more and more convinced the course itself is not, it's beyond the human. But the editing, as I went across those parallel col columns, it looked very human. Um, there are clearly editing errors. There are, it was obvious that the editors, whoever they were, I think it was clearly mostly Helen, um, often didn't understand what they were editing. And there were, there were interesting patterns, like when something was taken out, it never came back in. And that led me to conclude that each editing process was only done consulting the most recent version, never going back to the original. Hmm. And you could see that in the parallel columns. Ken Wapnick did confirm that to me. Mm -hmm. um, also, there were patterns that based the, probably the, the most kind of overall pattern I could see was that anything that got referred to in the world if it was, you know, voting machines or a person like Freud or Edgar Casey or Gene Dixon, oh. anything that got referred to in the world, like the Inquisition, for instance, it was taken out. And you could see this overall bias, which was like, if it refers to specifics in the world, it comes out. And the, the end result was to make the course whether intentionally or not, I think it was intentionally, read in the early chapters that were full of specific references, more like it reads in the later chapters that are very abstract and lofty and beautiful. And to me, you know, we already know Helen had a bias against the early chapters. She was embarrassed by them. Um, she loved the later chapters that were more poetic and, and abstract and beautiful. And I felt like as I just looked over thousands of editing decisions that had been made, you could build a kind of profile of the editor, which I think, again, was mainly Helen. She had a bias against the specifics. She didn't want or feel she had time to go back prior to the most recent version, to go back to the start and reevaluate all their decisions. She didn't always understand what she was editing. So I came to conclude the editing was a very human process mm -hmm. uh, done by somebody who had the best of intentions. You don't see someone trying to mess with the teachings. You see someone trying to respect the, the, the teachings and the material. But I felt I saw a very like demonstrably human process. And, and what resulted was just so much that got lost. And I do believe this was the voice of Jesus. And I've, I've spent a lot of years reading mm -hmm. New Testament scholarship where New Testament scholars would give their eye teeth to have a reliable sentence from Jesus. Yeah. And sure. here we had, you know, something like 45,000 words that ended up on the cutting room floor that I felt were extremely profound and practical and clarifying. So I just became convinced like it had to be done. Um, and yeah, of course, Helen said, this is, the, this is the version she approves of. I think in many ways, she was the problem. She was an amazing channel, but she was an, a, a human and perfect and even biased editor. Um, and we had a ton of guidance as well to, to do this. So getting back to your question of how is this different? Uh, 
Well, there's, there are differences, um, which I'll mention. The most important thing in my mind is, is it's still a course, right? The course is the course. And so whatever edition one reads from, like study that, practice that, take that to heart. That's, that's the truly important thing. Uh, the main, let me just go through the main differences. One is that the differences are primarily in the first four, four to eight or so chapters, but mainly the first four chapters in the text. Hmm. And um, there is a huge amount of material we've restored in those chapters. Um, and that material is extremely clarifying because what Jesus was doing in those early chapters was he was presenting these new teachings that were unfamiliar to Helen and Bill, of course. And to aid them, he's constantly tacking them down to real world examples and illustrations and events in the lives of Helen and Bill. If you're teaching material that is unfamiliar, if you're a good teacher, you're giving illustrations, you're giving specific examples. And so that's what was going on. And I think that's immensely clarifying for those teachings. And that's what got stripped out. So we've restored that. Uh, there's also even material that remained, it had a lot of wording changes. So that in the first four chapters of the text, of the sentences that they kept in, only 20% of those sentences retained their original wording. Oh. So we tried to our utmost to, re to keep that original wording. Okay. Mm. And so that's the, that's the big difference really in terms of the course itself. We've also added footnotes to aid the reader and the footnotes were often kind of required if we were going to keep material in. So if, say Carl Jung was referenced. To understand what Jesus said, you kind of needed to have some background in psychology. I would think so. Maybe that's and one of the reasons it was left out. <laughs> well, I think so, because to leave it in, you'd, you'd need a footnote. And there was one footnote that Helen and Bill put in the Hugh Lynn version, interestingly, but just one. But I think the footnotes, they allow that material to stay in and not just confuse the reader. Um, so we have a ton of footnotes in there just in different ways to help the reader with different kinds of things, um, like pronoun clarification for one thing. And then finally in the back of the, what we call the CE, um, there are 33 cameo essays and they're built around material that Helen took down that was literally not suitable for the course itself. One of the things Jesus made clear about editing, and he did expect them to edit, was mm -hmm. that the material needed to read as if it was written to everyone and not just specifically to them. So if there was material that was directed at them but could be lightly edited and read as if it was written to everyone, Helen and Bill would sometimes do that. Keep something in that was written to them but edit it to read to everyone. We just mm -hmm. did that more often than they did. Mm -hmm. um, but there were some things that it was just too personal to them. And so uh, we didn't want to lose it entirely because sometimes that's among the most clarifying material for Jesus mm -hmm. to speak to specifics in their lives and comment on situations and relationships and particular events. That's where you have no doubt at all about what he's getting at. And so instead of just keeping it out of the course, we put it in an appendix and we built a cameo essay around each chunk of that guidance that was too personal. And that's where you, as I said, can really see his picture of how this gets lived out unmistakably. So it's really those four things, restored text, restored wording, footnotes, and cameo essays. Uh, Ken often said that, <clears throat> that Helen wasn't clear in the beginning herself, she knew that, that and the analogy I'm sure you know that he used was it's like you go into a house, nobody's been in there for a while and you turn the faucet on on the sink and it runs rusty until that kind of clears up. 
and that Helen kind of ran rusty in the beginning, but it got clearer and clearer. And then, as you know, there's no changes at all, for, I guess, or no changes at all, say in the workbook, for example, or the, the pamphlets, or that sort of not thing. Not a lot. Yeah, no. not a lot. I wouldn't think so. All right. Yeah. So that she became clearer. I think it's, it's any, I'm sure that we've got there's some poets uh, on screen right now that, um, you know, when you start doing poetry, it, I don't know, it's, it's something that kind of comes to you. You kind of want to say, well, thank you very much. I don't know where that came from, but, but great. And you, as a poet, you get better over time mm -hmm. because yeah. you're hearing better over time. Right. So right. that it, it sort of begins to ring in the mind. And so this is what happens with Helen, which is very much why some of that original stuff, I mean, it does make sense to me that the stuff about them and or, or other people like the, Freud, Jung, those people, that that perhaps did not need to be in there. But you're saying that that clarifies them to put that in there. I think it's immensely clarifying. And I don't think they took, like there's two views here. One is that her ability to hear got imp improved and mm -hmm. resulted in material coming out that had a kind of a more lofty and more, more um, unified character. And Jesus explicitly says that. Mm -hmm. But while saying that, he calls the early notes a strong testimony to truth. And to me, mm -hmm. that rules out the second view. The second view is that because she was rusty, a lot of stuff was coming through that was just wrong. And that's why it was taken out. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I don't think a lot of things were coming out that were just wrong. Um, that's not the attitude that Jesus seems to have had, calling the early notes a strong testimony to truth. His view was that it got higher and more unified, but it didn't go from just full of falsehood to only truth. I think things were taken out because of that idea, A, that he didn't want things in there about their personal lives, and B, I think Helen was uncomfortable with those specific references I'm to sure things in the world. Yeah. And so that's a different view than she was getting lots of error in the beginning. I don't think that was true. And I don't think there's explicit support for that anywhere. And, but you think it's important that that specific stuff be there? Well, not the stuff that's too personal for the course, right. but the other stuff, I think it is because what happens is we all open this book and we are wondering, like, what is this really driving at? What's it saying? And, you know, like, for instance, what's, what's a miracle? And the, with the FIP edition, because the specifics are taken out, it feels very cryptic. It's very abstract. And you're often left wondering, you know, what's being said. Once those specifics are left in, things are much clearer. And you, we get a kind of a foundation in the early chapters because of all those specific references that I think orients us for the rest of it. And with those specifics, I think we get a solid foundation. So let's go to the second part of my question I asked a moment ago. Okay. Does, Sorry, I does, forgot that. Well, that's all, no, no big deal. <laughs> does difference make a difference? Or, or are we not reading the same book regardless of which book we're reading here yeah in essence, in essence i mean where this is the course of miracles period well okay. i think i think this is the course yeah and the basic teachings obviously are the same um so from my standpoint you know we're all students of the course whatever edition we're using uh the difference that i feel is is made is that what we did had really two goals in mind. One was like, if this really is Jesus, let's preserve of mu as much of Jesus as we can. The other goal was to serve the reader so that the reader has the fullest, clearest, most helpful experience possible. And so we were trying to meet both of those objectives at once. And my experience is, well, I, I'll, my personal experience is, I'm sure, uh, heavily biased, but, but we hear from people all the time that they feel a difference. Not that it's a different, different book or anything, but people will often say it's so much clearer, or I couldn't get into it until I, I read the CE, or 
I feel like Jesus is so much more personal and, and, and immediate to me now, because I think a lot of the material there where Jesus speaks in the first person is in those early chapters. And a lot of it did get taken out. Um, or, you know, we just hear from people who feel it's made a big difference for them. And I'm sure we could hear from people who would say the opposite, who would say, I love the FIP edition and I connect with that the most. Uh, so I think the, the main thing is not that it's a different book, it's a different path, it's definitely not that, but I think readers often have a fuller, clearer experience with the CE. We were aiming for that, of course, and it's really gratifying to, to hear that from people. So can you point to anything specific between the two, the FIP and, and what you've come up with editions that would be really different? I mean, that, that, that really edifies or that takes in a little different path kind of than what we find in FIP. It's mostly about things that add and fill out. It's not about things that contradict. I don't think okay. there are those things. There um, are none? Not to speak of. I mean, there um, are passages that say, that say different things, but, but whole teachings I don't think are, are there. Like one of the uh, examples that I've, that I've uh, pointed out is there's a place in the text in chapter 18 where Jesus says in the FIP edition, um, prepare you now for the undoing of what never was. And originally it said, prepare you not for the undoing of what never was. Because it follows directly on the little willingness section um, and was originally part of the little willingness section, which is don't prepare for the holy instant. So um, what's the difference between not and now? Well, if I said, you know, prepare you now for a meteorite to hit your house, that would be very different than prepare you not <laughs> for that event, right? One is saying, do it, do it now. The other is saying, don't do it at all. Um, and in fact, that's one of those places where even, you know, I mean, uh, Dr. Bob Rosenthal has said to me that in future editions of the FIP edition, they're going to change that and correct that. They're going to change um, it to not? To not, yeah. Um, in context, it's very clear that not is the correct reading. So there are little things like that, but mostly it's not about little, you know, isolated sentences where there's a different meaning. It's, to me, the, the major effect is having whole teachings often communicated over, you know, over different sections, different chapters that just fill the picture out. You know, so for instance, there is a whole view of the mind, of the levels of the mind that was present in the first oh, four chapters of the text. Um, there's the superconscious, the conscious, hmm. the unconscious. The unconscious has two levels. There's the superficial unconscious and the, the um, miracle level, which is the deeper level of the unconscious. And that's a fascinating picture mm. of the mind that I find illuminating and, and practical. Yeah, uh, there's a much clearer, I think, understanding of what the miracle is, which is a big deal since it's the Course in Miracles. So, you know, one of the things we say to people is again and again, Jesus says a miracle, miracles are expressions of love. He never says not once that they are a shift in perception um, or words to that effect, he repeatedly says they're, they're expressions of love. And in talking to Helen and Bill, there are quite a number of specific situations that he labels miracles. And they're always some, something where one person is expressing love or wisdom to another person. Um, <clears throat> now, I think the more familiar internal miracle where something shifts inside is in there. <clears throat> It's just a secondary meaning, but that makes a difference. Uh, the sex material is, oh, yeah. is, you know, it's frankly not fun. Um, no. Not a lot of us are super comfortable with it, no. but it's a case where Helen herself admitted in the pages of her notebooks to being uncomfortable with it. And 
she basically, while writing about, about her discomfort with it, she basically got confirmation that it was meant to be there. Really? Yeah. Um, she's writing to Bill in her notebook saying, I hadn't intended to write a commentary on sex. And she's wondering if it's just her stuff. And she, she said that was later corrected by Jesus to read, God knows I hadn't intended to write a commentary on sex. And then Jesus added, answer, he does indeed. And, you know, I think you get the import of that right away. It's like, it, it sounds like it frames her as the innocent channel and God is the one in charge. Mm. <clears throat> and so I, did, I originally didn't want to have all that stuff in our edition. But I became convinced that from that place and other places that he did. And it's his book. So there are a lot of cases where, <clears throat> where there are whole teachings that aren't, I believe, in conflict at all with what's in there, but they just fill out the picture and in many cases bring it down to earth, which is why I feel like there is so much value in those teachings and why I feel so strongly that we are all studying the course in whatever edition. So how do you, you, you personally, for example, handle the, the sex thing when it comes to around saying something like that sex is just for procreation and that's it? Well, good question. <laughs> what? <laughs> and, and we do have to deal with this because, you know, we're constantly teaching from this book. We're going through exactly. it every year with our yeah. students. And, and, and I generally say two things. One is that as he talks about sex throughout chapter one, and chapter one in RCE is really long because there's so much extra material. As he keeps revisiting this topic, it's clear that his issue is that we have these natural miracle impulses arise in us and they're impulses to give love, okay? But as those impulses come through our unconscious mind and all the ego stuff that's stored down there, they get distorted. And rather than impulses to express love to another mind, they become impulses, you could say, to express lust to another body. And what happens is those impulses, which are supposed to power our function as miracle workers, you know, the impulse to express love is supposed to be governing our days and our interactions. He talks about miracle inspired relating so that all of our relating becomes inspired by miracle impulses. All of that gets co-opted and it becomes, the impulses become sexual and therefore they become diverted into a different direction. So if, you're, if your calling, for instance, was to become, you know, an artist and the impulses to do art become distorted and diverted into impulses to do something else entirely, you know, then your function doesn't happen. So, so I think his big point is don't let the sexual impulse take over and divert your real function of expressing love in this world. And that's a real issue. Um, it doesn't, that doesn't go so far as to say only has sex for procreation. Now, I think that that second teaching, that second issue is clearly in there. But I think what I always say is that's a high place to get to. And he hints that the only person that had sex in this pure way was his own mother. So he says she's the only one to have pulled it off. <laughs> um, and so I think that frames it as there's a lot of things in the course that he says that are really high attainments. And we encounter those all the time in the course. You know, on Lesson 157, you're supposed to have a full-blown out-of-time experience where you walk into heaven and lose touch with the world. Um, he says a lot of really high things in the course, and we just get accustomed to them. So to me, that vision where, you know, sex is for procreation is another one of those things that is at some kind of, you know, higher reach of spiritual development. 
um, for, for, I think most people, for some people, it seems rather natural. Um, it doesn't mean we all have to force ourselves behaviorally to be there. I think what we do need to do is attend to, you know, is sexuality diverting our miracle impulses off to its own direction? There's a lot to think about there. <laughs> there is. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot. <laughs> I mean, because there's also implications about homosexuality too, right? There is. And basically what he says, and very openly, is that homosexuality, he doesn't condemn it. Because, of course, he, Bill was homosexual. He never told Bill Obviously, to stop being yes. a practicing <laughs> homosexual. Right. He just says that heteros heterosexuality has a more natural potential. He's aware that homosexual people and heterosexual people are all, none of them are living up to what to the vision he's setting out, right? Everyone has had their miracle impulses to some degree diverted into sexuality. And he's saying not, he didn't, never said to Bill, you know, stop doing that. He just said there's a more natural potential because he said, ultimately, it's about bringing children into the world. Let's go back to the, that earlier quote that you mentioned, uh, prepare you now for the undoing of what never was. I've given sermons on that. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, that's been kind of one of my favorite passages, and I always understood oh. it. Prepare you now for the end. What never was is the ego itself. Mm -hmm. Prepare you now for the undoing. That's what we're undoing. We're undoing the ego. And there really isn't any un, un, any un ego, at least not in heaven. It is right within the context of the framework of this world and with our minds. We could say that there was, but that's not a reality if it's because it's not part of eternity. Well, I think that passage, which you know, never struck me as somehow wrong. I think that passage can be interpreted in a completely course consistent and edifying manner. But if you go through the previous section, the little willingness section, and you highlight all the references to preparation in some form and read, and I think prepare you, prepare you now in the FIP edition, I think it's the first line of the very it next is, section. Yes, it is, yeah. yes. So if you go through all those preparation references in the little willingness section and then read prepare you now or prepare you not, I think it's really clear that the meaning in context is prepare you not. That's why, you know, Dr. Bob. So was how do you interpret that. what not means then? And that, so, I mean, we're good, We're picking over a little word here, but still it seems to be important. Well, so what would not mean? Well, the theme in the little, little willingness section is about how we think we need to prepare ourselves for the holy instant by making ourselves holy by making ourselves pure enough and good enough to receive the holy instant. And he keeps saying, don't do that. That actually blocks the holy instant because it's the holy instant's job to purify your mind. So you shouldn't be trying to do its job before you're good enough for it to show up. So the specific notion of preparation there has to do with that. And so when he says, prepare you not for the undoing that what never was, he means preparation in that very specific sense. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I had no idea that you had a love for that line. Well, yeah, that, that the worked on is even the beginning line of one of my articles that I hmm. did some time ago. Because it seemed clear to me that what we were preparing, preparing you now for the undoing of whatever was, was the undoing of the ego. So... We're getting ready to get rid of, we're getting ready to free ourselves of this thing that seems to be capturing our minds. Sure. And there's a lie in the workbook that just says, prepare yourself for miracles. I don't think the course is against its form of preparation. It's just in that spot, it's talking about a form of preparation that it says is counterproductive. Mm -hmm. But obviously, you can take that line and read it in a way that's consistent with other references outside that spot to preparation. Right. Well, we won't get down to picking on <laughs> a little knot. <laughs> a little knot just got caught in this whole thing here. <laughs> you know, and I think you, your scholarship is obviously uh, 
brilliant and the de in depth that's amazing that you've gone into. It's just, you really are a scholar. There's no doubt about that. So thank you for doing that. So we're actually coming up on a, our break time now. So we're, we're very close to it. So I think this would be a good time to do it. So what we're going to do now is there's going to be a 10 minute break. Uh, uh, there'll be an intermission sign that will come on screen and a clock uh, telling you how many minutes you've got to get back here. So what happens when we get back, uh, Bud is going to be studying over right now, probably uh, what's been going on in the chat. He's going to share some of that. Uh, some of you that really would like to come on and, and ask questions and can. And then after Bud has done his sharing, any one of you who would like to talk to Robert and or myself can come online and do that. The hush hush. Of heaven holds my heart today. Myself. Welcome back, everyone. <clears throat> We're ready to begin again. Uh, let me just remind you, for those folks who uh, kind of came on after we already been started, a couple of things. One is that the fact that you're here with us today for the first time, uh, you're entitled to a free one-year subscription to Miracles Magazine. If we don't have your information, we may only have your email address. You have to contact us and tell us that you would like to have a free subscription to Miracles Magazine. And, of course, we would need your address in order to send that to you. If you're overseas, that is outside of the United States or Canada, uh, we can only do that digitally at this time. But you can get the digital version, uh, you just don't get the printed edition. So let's come back. Uh, Bud has been looking over what's been going on in the chat, and he's going to share that information with us now and uh, see where this takes us. <clears throat> Go ahead, Bud. Okay. There's a couple of different questions that have a theme going on, and... I think it's best summarized in this question. What are your thoughts on the CE being a course correction by Jesus and the Holy Spirit due to things like the celestial speed up and that there'll continue to be these corrections? <laughs> uh, I'm supposed to answer that, huh? <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I, I wish I, I had my direct pipeline to what they're planning up there. Uh, <laughs> I, we, all I can say is we had really strong and repeated uh, guidance to do what we did um, to do that addition. In fact, they, that's where the idea originally came from. Um, so I do feel that it was a guided thing. Um, of course, every course student claims that like everything we do is guided, right? <laughs> um, but uh that's, I think that's what sustained the project throughout the years uh, was the feeling that it was really meant to, to be done. In terms of course corrections to come, I just think that, uh, yeah, I don't think we've heard the voice of Jesus like this in 2000 years. Of course, he's going to stay watching over it. Of course, he's going to be directing things from the other side. Of course, we're going to make tons of mistakes. That's pretty much the main thing we do down here. <laughs> yeah. um, but I do think that he has not, he's not orphaned this course. He's still there directing its growth in the world. And so I look forward to unfoldments in the future. Well, for me personally, I think a lot of that is what we saw in Ken's journey books when he went back and really opened up and unfolded the entire course. Uh, mm. so I, I find those to be absolutely elucidating. Right. So there's, there's a, I'm sorry, John, did you want to say something? No, no, just, I'm just saying, right. <laughs> ah. Now there, another comment was that there's a footnote in the HLC version and an interesting story that relates to the need for the CE and we were wondering, Robert, if you would like to share that story. Oh, okay. We've got a pretty avid student out there, I guess. We do. Yeah, there is one footnote um, in the Hewlin Casey version, uh, which obviously was that footnote was written by Helen and Bill. And it says that there's a couple of references, actually several references to the spiritual eye in the early miracle principles. And uh 
the footnote in the Healing Casey version says the spiritual eye refers to the Holy Spirit. Um, but, and that's how it was later edited. So when you read in principles, I think 38 and 39 in chapter one and section one, uh, that, that the, the, the Holy Spirit is the mechanism of, of miracles, that originally read the spiritual eye is the mechanism of miracles. And, it's, and someone has a question I see, it's, it's E-Y-E. That's, it's, not, it's not the letter I, it's, it's, it's referring to the, the, the eye that sees. And it's just not right. It's not correct that the spiritual eye refers to the Holy Spirit. That is one of the really clear examples of editing, editing error. Um, later on, Jesus said, the spiritual eye or true vision. And that's how the spiritual eye is used in the early chapters as a way of talking about that faculty in us that sees with true vision. Later on in the course, the spiritual eye becomes the eyes of Christ. A very similar term. They're both talking about an eye or eyes that is spiritual in nature. Um, and so, unfortunately, that single footnote in the Hewlin Casey version was not correct. And, and the, the opinion behind that footnote guided future editing um, in ways that you know, I'm convinced where it was simply incorrect. I think it's just helpful. We just understand what spiritual vision is, which is being able to see things the way Jesus saw them or sees them. Right. That's all, that's all it's saying. The idea is that there's, you know, our physical eyes look on all these forms and there's a faculty in us that looks on the light of holiness in everyone and everything just as plainly as our physical eyes look on forms, right. which is an amazing thought. Um, but I do think that experiences of, of what the Course calls vision or seeing with the spiritual eye or with the eyes of Christ, I think they're actually pretty common. They happen all the time. It's just we don't know what the term is to use for them. Huh. You know, one of the other things that I might throw in to begin here is that we're talking about not just different versions of the course, but now what we have, of course, as well, is things like the course of love. There's a lot of other additions or channelings that have been coming through, and it's kind of where they fit in relationship to the course. I personally think the course is golden. At the same time that I think it's golden, I'm aware of the fact that there are other people who have been receptive, and I'm not willing to throw their stuff away or to say that they haven't been able to be receptive themselves. So that over time will be something we'll be looking at uh, consistently, I suppose. And hopefully yeah. without a bunch of contradictions. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a big issue there, of, is the teaching consistent? At the same time, where I've come to is that I think something truly rare and unique happened with the course coming through. And I think that even though it's... It's not well understood. It's not widely appreciated in our world. It's not something everyone knows about. Um, there's something in it that is so mm. compelling yeah. that I think the course will, will stay popular and grow in popularity. And I personally think the other, I mean, I've seen in my years with the course, which I'm sure you've seen too, John, uh, I've seen a lot of other channelings from the author of the course. They have their day and then they kind of pass away. Mm -hmm. And I think that's going to happen with, with other ones as well, because there's something that happened with the course that just isn't going on. It's not present in them. That's my One opinion. of the differences with the course, the thing that's, that's beautiful is the fact that we, not, we have a textbook and a workbook and a manual and the supplements. And with all that, the fact that you've got a workbook in addition that means that you're doing this on a daily basis. That really adds a lot to it. And not only doing it on a daily basis, but hopefully maybe coming back and doing it again. Because somebody sent me an email not long ago that said, this is not the same book I read 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, of course, it's not the same book you read 20 years ago. You're not the same person that you were 20 years ago. Yeah. You know, hopefully you've matured a lot. So as we mature in this, it's all going to change for us individually in terms of our ability to see, getting back to vision again, and be able to hear what's being said. We shouldn't yeah. be surprised if people don't get it in the beginning, but the more you hang with it, the more, the clearer and clearer and clearer it gets. No doubt yeah. about it. 
I, I think your point about the workbooks is a really good one. I mean, yeah. we, we need instructions to practice or it just becomes yeah. stuff we talk about. That's right. And, uh, you know, I've, I've seen Jesus, th- things supposedly channeled from Jesus that kind of are not big on, on practice. And yet the course itself is really big on practice. Yeah. Right. Practice, practice, practice. Right. Yeah. Back to you, Bud. What else is, uh, did you see? We've got a couple the, of more here. Um, mm-hmm. So, uh, Robert, you mentioned that in text chapter two, things like magic and a couple of other things that are different. Can you speak more to that? It was just this one passage that it, it didn't make sense to me as it appeared in the FIP edition. It was just one place. And that's why I looked there first when I got the Healing Casey version initially. Um, it basically said that, um, oh, gosh, darn it. <laughs> I should know this. Okay. Let me just find it real quick. Okay. okay. No worries. Yeah. Um, let's see. Okay. It says, all material means that you accept as remedies for bodily ills are restatements of magic principles. So when you, basically it's medicine. Right. Right. When you mm-hmm. accept a material, something material as a remedy for bodily ill, a bodily ill, that's a restatement of magic principles. Then he says, this is the first step in believing that the body makes its own illness. And then it is a second misstep to attempt to heal it through non-creative agents. So he's saying the, f- the first step, this is the first step refers to accepting material means as remedies for bodily ills. Then the second misstep is to attempt to heal it through non-creative agents. Well, those two steps are exactly the same. They're both attempting to heal the body through conventional medicine. And I thought something's wrong there. I think what he was saying was the first step was believing the body made its own illness. And then the second step is when you attempt to heal it through Mm -hmm. material means. I just thought that's what it had to have said. And in fact, that's exactly what the original dictation did, did say. So that was just one passage. But, you know, I, I'm absolutely convinced that the way she received it originally was, was correct. Fascinating. Fascinating. Thank you. Um, here's uh, outside of just comparing books, okay, and, and editions and all of that. Can you speak to, because you talked a lot about preparation, And in the Miracle Principles, it talks about the notion of purification is necessary. Can Mm -hmm. you speak to that, this notion of purification? Yeah, that comes up so much. I think because we're used to the idea of purification from other places like maybe traditional religion, where the purification might be of the soul, or maybe the purification in some spiritual systems might be you purify your body. In the course, it's really clear that you purify your thinking or your mind. And that's said overtly in the workbook, Mm -hmm. that your your thoughts must be purified. And what what the one thing is worth noting here is that just about every single one of the miracle principles is talking about miracles not as inner shifts, but as expressions of love through you to someone else. And so What that principle number seven is saying is that before you can be a channel that through which love expresses to someone else, you have to have your own thoughts purified. Mm -hmm. And so I think that makes perfect sense. Like how can, just like, just like Helen was a rusty channel in the beginning and she needed to be sort of cleared out. So we're like that, you know, until our thoughts are purified, love can't move through us like it would want. Oh, yeah. I sometimes think that that particular passage could also be used in a very practical sense. We're purifying our thoughts. Of course, that's the main idea. Purifying our thoughts might include going on a fast. <laughs> it might include cleaning up my room. <laughs> you know, just setting the world in order, so to speak, so that my mind becomes more in order. Sometimes whether the physical and the mental can, can combine. So yeah, I think if that. we were, sorry, I, I think if we were really like on it with the mind, we wouldn't need those things, but I kind of well, need those sure. things. You know, I mean, I need it. I need a clear space, 
Um, I actually, I, I do, you know, uh, do juice fasts, fasts sure. occasionally. Um, but uh, yeah, ultimately, you know, it's about the mind. And uh, yes, I think the course is really clear on that. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Very clear. It's all in our heads. <laughs> Here's another question for you. Robert, how do you see the term the Holy Trinity as heaven is an awareness of oneness? Right. This is a huge, huge issue, I think, in understanding the Course, um, that different Course students and teachers understand differently. I think if we say heaven is just oneness, and therefore there can't be a Father and a Son and a Holy Spirit, I think the Course's thought system, in my view, really collapses. Heaven, the Course is very clear, is beyond the understanding that we can get in these brains, right? These brains are not much smarter than dog brains. So why do we think we can grasp heaven? And the Course says we can't. Um, I think we have to embrace a view, which the Course, in my view, puts forward on every page that says, Yes, in heaven all is one, but God still created a son. The son is one with him, but the son is effect and God is cause. And in response to the separation, God created the Holy Spirit, who is one with God and yet is an effect of God, is not God himself, is God's voice. Um, I think we need to have a view in which we allow for numerical difference in heaven, while affirming that even in the midst of numerical difference, there is oneness. Can we understand that? I'm not sure we can, mm. but how much can we? I mean, if you hand a physics book to a dog, is it going to understand it? <laughs> Obviously not. You know, are we going to understand heaven in these brains and these bodies? I don't think so. And there's actually a point in the course that talks about, like, let's say, time and eternity. And it really says, you know, you really don't understand eternity. I mean, because we're kind of trapped in time, and eternity is not a very long time. It's a totally another dimension altogether that mm -hmm. we're looking at here, that we're approaching. So with our, like our poor little human minds can't quite grab, I mean, even Einstein was struggling with that one. And Einstein got up to, to the point of realizing the time was an illusion, but at the same time, he's realized it's an illusion, what the Course says very clearly, it's a vast illusion. At the same time, there's no real clear statement about what eternity is. Because, first of all, we're going beyond words at this point. We're really mm -hmm. transcending language. Mm -hmm. and, and language itself, and the Course is very clear about this too, it's, it's a limitation in form. Just like our bodies are limitations in form, just like all the things of the world are limitations in form. We're transcending that limitation altogether. So um, we can have, a, I think, kind of an intuitive understanding of that, kind of a heartfelt, like, what is love? I mean, you know, that's kind of, you can't tell me what love is, <laughs> but you know it as an experience. Mm -hmm. That's no question. Yeah, yeah, I fully agree. Yeah. All right. You got more, bud? Um, I think that pretty much wraps it up. There's a, a okay. number of comments uh, in chat, which are absolutely wonderful. Okay. But I do see that Brooks very patiently had his hand up this whole time. Okay, well, let's go with the questions now. And, uh, you can, people can come online to ask the questions. Okay. Uh, Brooke here. Uh, Robert, I really appreciate your dedication to wanting to get all of Jesus' words that he gave to Helen. It's bothered me because I, I had been reading the, the, the the, the uh, Foundation for Inner Peace for like 30 some years before I realized there were these other editions. And so I, I appreciate your dedication in doing that. Now, one, my eyesight's not the same as it was, you know, I'm, I'm 80 now and I don't see as well, but you didn't talk about <clears throat> another edition that it's the only large print edition I was getting. It, the, the course, the society, the Course in, well, I forget which comes first, uh, Course, Course in Miracles, Miracles Society. Society. Yeah. And I thought once I had that, I thought it had all those missing words, those 45,000 words and, and stuff. What's the difference between what, you know, how much, how many more words, what's the difference about yours? Now, I know I have yours too, you know, I've been working with, but it's harder for me to read with the smaller sure. print. I can sure. 
Yeah. What, what's the difference between that society version and yours? In terms yeah. Of the information taken out. Well, my understanding is that their their edition of the text is basically the Hewlin Casey version. And the Hewlin Casey version was the edition produced by Helen and Bill that immediately preceded the FIP edition. And what happened was when as we go from her handwritten notes to the ear text to her second draft, as Ken called it, to the Hewlin Casey to the FIP, at every stage, Helen keeps taking more words out. Um, mm-hmm. And you know, Ken Ken's view was she was a what he called a fierce over editor when she was embarrassed by something. He felt that she didn't do that with the course, but he she did do it with her poetry, with her autobiography, to the point where he had to take those away from her um, because she just kept editing. And that's what you see with the course itself. So with every transition from one edition you know, notes, Urtex, second draft, Hewlin Casey, FIP, to the next, more comes out. And so the Hewlin Casey being the second to last edition has, you know, more taken out of the 45,000 words that came out. I think it only retains about 13,000 of those 45,000 words. Mm. So it's closer it, in, the, in the chain, it's closer to the FIP edition than any other, than the previous editions that were produced. Not to say it's not something to, to read and to use and to even make your main edition, if that's what speaks to you. I'm just saying that it is in the chain closer to the FIP. Thank you. Are, are you planning on doing a large print version of the complete edition? We're not currently planning on that, but we are working hard on an app. And the app would allow you to make the print as large as you wanted. And which also would be true of the Kindle edition. I mean, it is available on Kindle and you can make the print just as large as you like. So you might want to, you you know, yeah, or on your phone, you know. And Kindle works on your PC too. So you don't have to look at it on a small screen. You can look at your Kindle on the large on your, screen and explode it as well. Right. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So you can do that. I was wondering about an index. Uh, is, it, is that in the plans as well? Like a concordance? Yeah. Concordance. You know. Is that too big a job? <laughs> I think we're going to let the search features on the app cover for that. Oh, okay. I don't think people are, are so much into concordances. I mean, I still use my FIP edition concordance yeah. all the time. It's huge. But I think that, that that went out of print for a reason. People just weren't responding. So we're hoping to have some really, really nice um, advanced search features in the app. Well, I meant the electronic process, not, uh, not a book. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, all we're planning on is just that just the making the app highly okay. searchable. Are there other questions? Um, we see yeah, hand. Alice has her hand up. Alice, if you'd like to um, ask your question. Yeah, I read, I wrote some things in the chat related to just my thoughts and remembering that Ken, when I asked Ken, you know, questions about the course and, and the origins and certainly when it came around with the Urtex and the other things um, that have been come to light of these other versions, and then Ken explaining that those first four chapters of the course were basically to build trust with Helen and Bill with Jesus. And it had to weave in real world personal experiences to build that trust. And I had that personal experience too with the inner voice of the course. In fact, felt like I was getting guided to the course by building a trust with the hearing and inner voice. Mm -hmm. And that inner voice has continued to use my personal experiences in everyday life and events but that's just for me to help build trust with my relationship with the Holy Spirit and Jesus, mm-hmm. not for me to share all that with everybody else. And mm-hmm. can explain it, that that was the whole purpose of editing it out was because it wasn't meant to be the information with everyone else, but a role mm-hmm. model of what it's like to build that trust with personalized, individualized lessons for you using that 
your whatever's going on in your life as part of your own experience. So to me, what you're describing when you said Jesus was more personal to you as you made the difference in what you've done, that you're an example of what, why Helen edited out all that information it was because it was an example of a personalized experience. And that's what we're all to learn from the example of the personalized experience that then yeah. that personalized experience is no longer your personalized experience because the guidance is always, well, contextualize this to everyone. You don't have to, you know, going to be whatever you're listening to in the music or the news of the day. And I get that kind of guidance every day to kind of weave this in and understand it in relationship of universal curriculum. So the whole yeah. purpose of the, of the specifics is to eventually take you out of the specifics as an example right. of how to universalize it. Well, yeah, let me say a few things to that. Um, I think there are some, some compelling reasons to, to disagree with Ken on that. Well, that's not um, what I'm talking about, disagreeing with Ken. I, I'm saying that he was saying that Helen said that she thought she needed to have it taken out by Jesus for that very reason. Well, maybe she did. I've never heard him say that. Um, what I see is a few things. One is that the stuff that came out it came out in dribs and drabs. Like if she recognized this should not be there, why not just take it all out? But it wasn't it, that it wasn't, shouldn't be there. It was that it was to help build her trust and Bill's trust with the Holy Spirit and Jesus. Yeah. And that's the whole purpose was to build trust, not having to do with the content or the specifics. The purpose is to build trust. With right, right, right. And that's, that's a view. Um, I, I don't think that's a true view. Well, maybe that's what, ex what your experience has been by you're going in depth. It's helped you build your trust with your relationship with all. Well, I think it has. Yeah. And I think, but there's more than just the trust. I mean, that's, that's true as well, but there's so much rich content in there. And yeah, some of the specifics are too personal to Helen and Bill's lives to include in the course proper. It's just too specific to their lives, but other things, you know, he talked about the inquisition, fascinating mm. stuff. He talked about all these things that really apply generally to all of us. And I think that the content of that teaching is so valuable. And so from my standpoint, the fact that, that it is so valuable and it is generally applicable, what he said was take out the stuff that is not generally applicable. And that's what we did. Um, but there's so much that is generally applicable. Like the Inquisition was not something special that happened in Helen Bill's lives at all. It's a historical thing we all know about. So from my standpoint, it's very telling that Helen took out the specific stuff in bits, a little bit as she dictated to Bill, a little bit as she typed the second draft, a little bit as she did the Hugh and Casey, a little bit as she edited with Ken. To me, all of that suggests that it was not some directive from on high to remove it all from the published edition, but that it was more an inclination in Helena, kind of a personal bent. And that's why it came out bit by bit by bit over many years. It could have come out bit by bit and by bit because she was hearing to universalize this. Don't keep making specifics. Don't keep making specifics. It's specific to you to build your trust, but ultimately to take it out because it's your ability to then universalize it yourself, that then everyone else can do the same thing. Take well, specifics and universalize it. Take specifics maybe, and universalize it. Maybe, but you know, even with the Think stuff that we... It's oh, the relationship I've, building. I've thought through all this at great length. It's Trust all me. about building that relationship with the Holy Spirit. Maybe, but even with, for instance, like, I don't know if you've read the cameos in the back of the CE. I... I suspect maybe you haven't, but... Yes, I did have a read for you. It's, and, I, it's, and whatever materials you drew to draw upon to deepen your relationship with the Course, it could be other authors' books like John's and Murray and Williamson's, again, like some of us use and other people use Ken's in-depth studies. Whatever it does to deepen your relationship with the Holy Spirit, taking whatever specifics are offered and then be able to universalize them, no matter whose teachings about it, it about it is. Okay, that, that's all is true. What I will say is that I consider Jesus my teacher. And I really want to know how he wants me to live his course. 
And even in places where we took material out and moved it to the cameos, because it was personal to Helen Bill's lives, I find it incredibly clarifying what he says about situations in their lives. I find it priceless because I want to know his picture of how I should live. Well, maybe he's, you know, I get guidance all the time from Jesus says, well, rewrite this sentence a little bit to personalize it for yourself. And I don't consider that something I'm sharing with anybody else. But he says, take this sentence in the course, rewrite it or revise it or make an outline of it. I get sort of inner guidance to deepen my practice. But the purpose is to deepen my relationship with the inner teacher, not to be such an expert in editing or rewriting it, but to deepen that relationship. So that the building of the trust, as you start to get the guidance, it's more and more clear and more and more, oh, this is for everybody, but you're being going through your specifics to universalize it. Do you understand what I'm saying? I do, yeah. Um, I just think something spoke through Helen that was unique. And I, I, I believe it was- so. I think we're all being guided to do the same thing that she's done. Okay, Jesus we're all being guided to be- to that voice and no other voice. We're all being guided to ultimately listen to that one voice. And, and I, trust, trust, like trust, you, trust. I appeal to that voice every day. I yeah. just think that voice spoke through her with greater clarity. I'm not the best channel in the world. Well, you and could so, be. Maybe I could be, but I, could be. I very much be. want to know, I very much want to know what Jesus thought about how to live this course. It's interesting when anyone would come to Helen and they would ask Helen, to, would you ask Jesus a question for me? She would always say, you can do it yourself, you know, and I'll, and I'll yeah, help yeah, you. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll pray with you or something to help you to see that you can do it yourself. All right. She wouldn't do it for somebody. Build that relationship, there and they go. will come. <laughs> <laughs> they will come. <laughs> Capital T. Thank you, Alice. Yeah. Other questions? Lynn has a, her hand up. She would like to yeah. join us here. All right. Good. Lynn, go ahead. Uh, namaste, mighty companions. Okay. I love that more and more things are coming out to resonate with more and more people. Mm -hmm. To... to yeah. I know when I opened the course, I was like, oh, my God, I'm validated. <laughs> this makes mm -hmm. make sense. What I lived through did not make sense. The course made sense. Mm -hmm. I, I gobbled up that text, and then I got to the, um, the, the lessons, and I felt like I hit a brick wall. I said, oh, no, I can't do a lesson a day. I got to the last lesson. I met John Monday in Interfaith. And the synchronicity, I'm grateful to say, has been like that. And I think the more ways that, that uh, Jesus can reach out, the better. And while we're, I, I, I was having an issue with a, a teaching that triggered me. And I, I, um, I wrote a little poem about it. It's very relevant to this. It, I, it's, I call it, I am here. Loved and beloved, embrace and joy, past pointers of language that can distract. Our heaven is one, form does not matter. Love is beyond dialect spoken. Heart takes over, straight from core. All notes play gratitude song. Thanks, Lynn. Very nice. Yeah, thank you. It's good. And, and to gather in love in any what can be better than being with people who just want to love each other? There you go. <laughs> what it all comes down to, isn't it? Best thing. How about anybody else? Uh, Sharon has her hand up. A couple people. Good afternoon. Hi. Thank you afternoon. so much for hosting this today. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, I have a question. Uh, I, I have uh, studied the, the um, foundation, the FIP version for, you know, 15 years. And I love the holistic feeling I have from the iambic pentameter part of things. Mm, how, yes. Especially the latter part, how it all, you know, I, 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 I just all, you know, I actually go to it to reassure myself that it is true, that it, it keeps adding up to oneness. And mm -hmm. I was just wondering if you could address, I also have been studying the last year, your um, 
Circle of Atonement. And I love it too. Um, we, we study it in my group on Wednesdays, every Wednesday. And it, the reference notes are so helpful. Thank you, Robert, um, for doing that. I'm just so grateful to be here. But anyway, my question is, is that did you take into uh, consideration the iambic pentameter? Like, does it do the same thing with your uh, version? Oh, of course. Thank yeah. You. Yeah. I mean, Jesus, um, I mean, it, it, Starts in chapter 24 in the text, and then it, it starts in Lesson 98 in the workbook. Um, and we just, I mean, Helen received it in I'm a Pentameter. It was not edited to be in that verse. And so we just, you know, printed it as she received it. Uh, and it's amazing, I think. Hmm. One really interesting thing is that she was getting it before she realized it. Mm -hmm. um, she, it was falling into this, this rhythm um, a while before she realized it. So it was part of Jesus's design for the book. Uh, and it does enhance the beauty of it. I think it's remarkable that she could just hear it, writing at full speed with her, with her handwriting and shorthand, and it's coming out in Ionic Pentameter. Mm. I had that Helen really loved Shakespeare and the new, and the King James version of the Bible, and so she had that kind of Elizabethan English in her mind as mm -hmm. she was working anyhow. Yeah, you know the so. iambic pentameter to me really represents that it's coming from such a high source because that's impossible to write just off the top of your head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, she was getting it too fast for it to come out in that verse form with that kind of beauty, the profundity of thought, everything that was going on with those sentences to just have it spill out like that. I don't think that's humanly possible. On the other hand, if you're a really good poet and you're really in tune with writing your poetry and it's kind of getting into that flow thing, it's better getting into that flow. Obviously, she got into it with consistency. Yeah, yeah. Well, Bill did that. Bill Shakespeare. Yeah, I'm glad you figured out which Bill. Bill Shakespeare. <laughs> Very good. And George has his hand up. Okay. So, George, if you'd like to come off mute. John, thank you. And of course, Rob. Uh, I, I was fascinated to hear that you spent uh, the uh, the last five years of Helen's life around her, I, I, I would like to know more about that. It's, it seems like the literature uh, talks about her being uh, troubled. Uh, was she, did she have happy moments and all of that? Uh, that priest uh, Benedict talks about her being uh, troubled is one where I got that from, but all right. I'd be fascinated to hear a little bit of that if you could share. Well, it's just it's a, Helen introduced me to the course in, in 1973, and in, in 75 right there. I met her in 73, but she didn't introduce me to the course in 75 in Ken Wabbing's apartment in New York City, along with Bill and a priest who was there at the time as well. And so she sort of became my therapist after that. So I was always on the receiving sign of her helping. Helen was a very good therapist. So she really knew how to, I didn't see that other side with her. I knew about that other side because Ken and Judy and other people would talk about it, but I didn't run into her contrariness. When she was on her helping side, when she was trying to be helpful to people, as she was with Tara Singh and, and others, she was very, very helpful. And she was right there and she was very loving. I always experienced her to be very, very loving. But keep in mind, she was like a, a mother in that sense. A uh, very kind and wise mother to me, so I never had that other relationship. I knew about it, but I didn't experience that. That was even to the end of her life. She was the loving mother to you. Well, not till the end of her life. I must say that during the last nine, six, nine months of her life, I didn't see her because once she got ill, uh, once she got the cancer, and even before the cancer, but but especially once she got the cancer, uh, she stopped seeing everybody. 
I see. The only person uh, she saw at all at that point were her doctor and her husband, uh, Ken, Judy, maybe. Uh, very, very few. She almost completely eliminated all of her contacts during the last nine months of her life. But up until then, she was mother therapist. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, George. Yep. And Mike has his hand up. Mike, if you'd like to come off of mute. Um, yes. Thank you, Robert, for all your work. What I'm curious about is, are there significant differences between the FIP and CE editions um, in the workbook and in the manual for teachers, mm -hmm. or is it largely in the uh, text? Yeah, good question. It's mostly in the text towards the early chapters of the text. Um, <clears throat> there are little differences. I mean, Helen did feel a freedom to fiddle with the language. And so there are little differences um, in the workbook, in the manual, but not enough to make a real difference. You know, I could point out certain passages where in that passage, it makes a difference. But the kind of macro differences that are in the text just aren't there in the workbook and manual. Okay. What about the supplements? Is that something you plan on? editing in some way or in the future? We would love to have the ability to publish the supplements. Um, those, unlike the rest of the course, are they were never uh, out from under copyright. So, um, you know, we would love to publish them, but not, not if the Foundation for Inner Peace is not giving us permission to do that. Okay, so there they, they there are, are very, very few changes. I don't think there's hardly anything changes there. Not in the supplements, not in the psychotherapy pamphlet, et cetera. But at that time, Helen was really clear. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's, I can't, I haven't looked at, well, I don't have access to the original dictation of the Song of Prayer. And I haven't looked at the original dictation of psychotherapy in detail and compared it to what's in there. But I'm sure it's, it's just like the situation with the workbook and the manual where it's virtually word for word. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank right. you. And Lisa has her hand up. Lisa, if you'd like to come off of mute. Yeah. I, hi, can you guys see me okay? We can yeah. now. Yeah. Okay. Can now. I just wanted to thank Robert. I. Um, for me, what I've learned from the FIP, but also from Robert, as I'm a student of the CE, is to not look for the differences, to look for the similarities to what you, you, what you said, Robert, about Jesus being your teacher. That, that calls to me. Um, I've had nothing but wonderful experiences from your classes. Uh, I hear the truth. I hear the truth from John. I just want unity and there's nothing uh, the course says over and over there's nothing to defend yeah. and that's and that's the truth for me i also mm -hmm. love choose again because in the course it teaches we need to look for our beliefs our concepts um i didn't really know how to do that and dedrick has been a teacher for me as well on how to see what my upset is it's not about robert doing anything it's not about helen doing it it's my upset what am i what is the belief that i'm carrying why am i so defensive or wanting to defend something. That's what I'm learning to look at. It's not outside me. <laughs> this right. is a roadmap. This is a roadmap for all of us to join and walk home together. Robert, thank you. John, thank you. And Emily, I know you're out there somewhere. Thank yes, you. Yeah. All, all of your love and everyone in this group. It's all about love and joining, guys. Yep. Thank you so it much. Is. That's all I wanted thank to say you. is thank you. Right on, Great Lisa. to have you here, Lisa. Ah, right Lisa. On. That looks like it's it as far as people with their hands up. Okay, well, we still have about uh, 14 minutes uh, for whoever would like to come in. I think, let I me just sort of back up. Oh, did you have a question? Oh, Carolyn no, has her hand up. Okay. You're, out, you're still on mute, Carolyn. There you go. Am I there now? Yes, there you yes. good. Can you hear me? Mm-hmm. Um, I think, how do I want to say this? 
it seems to be very clear to me that we're all asked to be teachers of the course. Mm -hmm. And I, and I'm grateful to all of those, all of you everywhere who are, I I don't want to not say teachers, but almost translators, people who have lived it and you bring it to all of us. But a, a thought hit me the other day is, and I'm, I'm, is that I think when you teach the course too, is more about demonstrating yes. what the course is. Of course. You, you can't, I like, I would never go out and try to teach the course for now anyway, at all. But I think every day we teach it by demonstrating it. And the only way we do that is to practice. Um, I think it's important though, that what, what I like what you were saying, Robert, and what you're bringing forth. Um, my question, I guess, is, is it absolutely necessary to, to jump, I guess, to a different text? Or is it, is it, just as valid to stay with the with the FIP text? And are we going to still be able to learn it and live it? I guess is my question. I don't know if I'm clear on that or not. Uh, yes, it's absolutely necessary. No, of course not. <laughs> no, of course not. I mean, I studied the FIP edition up until the moment we um, released our edition publicly uh, five years ago. So, um, I, you know, what matters ultimately is the thought system, the practice, and that's there. So, of course, uh, whatever edition calls to you. But I do want to put a word in, I, I do want to say something about teaching. Because I, I think often teaching gets a bit of a bad rap in Course in Miracles circles. I agree with you. The fundamental way that we teach is through demonstration. But we teach in many ways. Early in the text, Jesus says that we teach through formal means, meaning formal teaching, through guidance, which I assume means guiding and counseling people in life, and above all, by example. So he favors the teaching through example, through demonstration. And yet I think he, he absolutely wants people to teach this material. Um, I think awesome. in the manual for teachers, you know, it's a manual for teachers of A Course in miracle, Miracles. Um, so I think we, we should really affirm the act of teaching this and affirm that the most important way of teaching is by example. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank if you. I might throw a word in there, I think the Ken Walmnick's example in living the course was just superb. I, I constantly regard him as kind of an older brother that just really set a very high bar in terms of putting this stuff into practice. That's my personal experience. Anybody else? Lynn has her hand up again. Lynn? Would you like to join us? I just want to express my gratitude. Robert, it's so good to see you. And I love your book. I got it. And um, like I, I grew up with, with the uh, other version, but they're, they're, all of, they're all about the same thing, and it's about love. Right. And, and I'm so grateful. Like, I, you know, that it, different words might draw, draws different people in. And um, where the light spread, and boy, <laughs> spread yeah, and spread. Yeah. <laughs> thank God for that. Yeah, thank you. I just think that the more it's a sign of maturity to say, I affirm the various editions. This one may be the one I use, but hey, we're all following the same path. I think the more the, the more that we duke it out over additions, it's it's not only unsightly, it's it's not spiritually mature. Huh. Well, the copyright, look at what happened with the copyright. It loses mm -hmm. meaning 
with, you know, but I guess all things, the lessons God would have me learn. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was, that was a mess. All right. Well, let me say that I, I really don't think it matters what, what, what edition you're reading. It, the message is there, and the message is the same. And I, Robert, you edify a, a lot of interesting pieces to it. I kind of, as a, a scholar bit myself, I like to kind of dig in there and say, oh, that's an interesting little difference. That kind of does add some edification to the process here. Um, I will probably continue to work primarily with the FIP edition. Um, of course, that's just the way it is. <laughs> Uh, anybody else? Yeah, it looks like Leslie has his hand up. Leslie, if you want to come off of mute. First, I want to say thank you very much to both of, both of you gentlemen, uh, John, for hosting this, and Robert for uh, agreeing to come on to, to enlighten us about a lot of things. I'm going to ask what seems to be a simple question here, but I'll ask it anyways. Robert, what is your view of the, uh, of the world in the... Um, in all of this, I uh, and I'll and I'll explain why I asked the question mm -hmm. um, afterwards. Uh, view of the world. Can you say <laughs> a bit more about that's just a the view of the world as it relates to um, as it relates to a course of miracles, whatever whatever edition you're talking in whatever edition you're talking about, the whole issue of the world being an illusion uh, I, is what I'm specifically referring to. Okay. Okay. Yeah. My view is that, that the forms we see are an illusion <laughs> that, that the world as we know it is a dream, but a collective dream. And I believe that the minds that are identified with those forms, you know, I have a mind identified with this form. We all are identified with the form of our own bodies you know, there are minds identified with the animal bodies out there. And I personally think the course has some tantalizing references to mind being identified with not just humans and animals, but plants and, and grains of sand, interestingly. So I think that the minds are real. Your mind is real. It may be from the course's standpoint asleep, but a sleeping mind is still a mind. It's still real. Um, so my belief is that the course is very clear that the forms of this world were not created by God, that time and space was not created by God. Um, but that the minds that are identified with these forms are sons of God that he did create. They're members of the sonship. Uh, I think that the, that the world is, you know, it's largely a messy nightmare compared to the happiness of heaven. Um, at the same time, I think the Holy Spirit has a hand in everything. He can't just make it all go his way because, you know, it's our free will. Um, it's our classroom. But I think that he is constantly involved in every little thing. His influence is there. Um, and his influence is attempting not so much. It's not about the forms changing. I think the forms will change. It's primarily about he's trying to educate our minds in the direction of love and forgiveness and in the direction of ultimately awakening to our real home, our real location, which is heaven. Um, so I think that in my view, the course's teaching on the world is kind of complex. You know, it's not as simple as this is all my dream. I really don't think it's all my dream. I think my experience of it is, is something I'm dreaming. But I think you've got, you're here, you know, you've got your experience. Um, so I don't know if I hit all the bases that are relevant to, to what was behind your question, but uh, there, there you have my, my short view. The reason I asked the question was, you know, I, I'd heard some stuff and I can't remember where that the the view of the world was was different than what my understanding of what the uh, of what the course taught and i must and i must admit that you know the bits and pieces i've read from the uh, complete and abridged edition do not support that at all that you know it's very consistent with what 
you know, whatever edition of the course of, the, of a course in miracles that I've read, exactly as you have, you know, you have just elucidated, and John's taught, John's talked about, many other people have talked about as well. So, I appreciate the fact that you um, you expanded on it and um, illustrated it. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. We're very near the end of our time, folks. We may be t- time for one more question and then or observation. And then we're going to, Robert, you want to do any sort of summarize? Let's do that. Let's, let's give you a couple minutes here to sort of summarize where you think you're at and I'll summarize and we'll get Bobby on to help us uh, close. Yeah. Okay. Well, gosh, we, we've been at this for two hours. Yeah. It's hard yeah. to summarize. Just, just like that. <laughs> <laughs> I think for me, um, you know, the heart of my involvement with the Course really has to do with my belief that this is from Jesus. I don't think all Course students have that belief or even need that belief. But for me, the fact that I believe that just entails so much. Mm-hmm. And I find that any time Helen took down something from him, I just find it so valuable. And, and so that was really, and I think, I, I think that's been clear through these two hours, that that was the driving force behind a kind of an edition that had more of the original words mm-hmm. and more of the original wording. Um, and I think we've also been, both you and I, John, we've both been very clear that the course is the course in whatever form. Right. Um, the, the, the teaching is, is the same. And it's teaching that, you know, is not easy for our egos. No. Egos don't want to tolerate us really forgiving, really loving, unconditionally. Right. Um, so we need all the help we can get with that. And I feel like the Course provides that help in a way that, that nothing I've encountered does. Right. Uh, so beyond that, I don't know. I think those are the big facts for me. I mean, we've, we've right. ranged all over the place. But to me, uh, <laughs> that perhaps sums it up. Right. Thank you. And I have to agree with you 100% on that. Uh, Jesus has always been really important for uh, me, too. Uh, what I'm going to be doing at the end of uh, February and the end of March is doing a six-week workshop on Jesus in the Course and Jesus in the Bible. You know, I just see tremendous overlaps and similarities between the two of those, and I, I think it's very exciting that they're there. Other people have done that comparison, but it, it's, it's going to be fun to kind of really focus that on why it seems to be the same voice that are appearing in both of those cases. Hmm. So, um, let's that see, sounds Bobby. Great. Huh? Looks like we have Bobby here. All right, good. So, uh, what we're going to do is I'm going to ask Bobby. I'm going to put on screen the, uh, the Lord's Prayer from A Course in Miracles. And uh, Bobby, and, and then once this is done, uh, let's go back into full screen with everybody on screen and let's just sort of slowly say goodbye to each other. Bobby, are you willing to uh, sing this for us? Forgive us our illusions, Father, and help us to accept our true relationship with you. In which there are no illusions and where none can ever enter our holiness is yours what can there be in us that needs forgiveness when yours is perfect. The sleep of forgetfulness is only the unwillingness to remember your forgiveness and your love. Let us not wander into temptation, for temptation of the Son of God 
is not your will. And let us receive only what you have given and accept but this into the minds which you created and which you love. Amen. 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 Thank you, Bobby. Thank you again, Robert, for joining us today. Uh, if you would you. like to see future Sunday with Monday, go to miraclesmagazines.org and you'll see the list of, it's not every Sunday, but we do this at least once a month, sometimes twice a month. It just depends on how we've got the folks stacked up. And Robert, right. uh, I hope that you return. Thank you. It was absolutely yeah. educational and fascinating. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you. bud. Thank you.